Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's get started. Okay. I think attendance is uh, smaller and smaller, right? <laughs> yeah, probably we won't. Uh, we should stop the recording, right? Um, but anyway, um, I feel like the most effective way of learning this is still to uh, join the class in person and interact with the instructor when necessary. That is the most efficient way of doing that. I know some students are like, okay, I just skip the lectures. And uh, um, when the deadline approaches, uh, they just look through the slides and they want to grasp, grasp the content like in one hour or two hours and start doing the homework. Uh, that, that is actually not that useful, especially um, in, your, in our class. Uh, you do need some um, like understanding the connection of those uh, points, right? You just uh, uh, work over those uh, slides. It's, uh, it won't be like taking just one hour, two hours. You can go through 100 slides. Uh, there are many subtle uh, uh, which are emphasized in the class and uh, you need to interact with the instructor or at least you listen to the instructor and listen to the details. Um, um, that will be much more helpful. Okay. So um, remember, uh, tomorrow is the deadline for homework uh, uh, three, and we'll have like uh, two remaining homeworks. One will be about support back machines, um, which are gonna wrap up in two classes, I guess. And uh, then the last homework assignment is about uh, artificial neural network, uh, perhaps including the logistic regression. But anyway, the, the major, uh, topic about the final homework assignment is about uh, is the uh, artificial neural network and uh, more specifically back propagation. Um, that's I think that will be the uh, final, not final topic, but uh, the final most important topic. Um, okay, so let us continue with the support back machines. In the uh, last lecture, we uh, introduced the primal and dual form for the general constraint optimization problem. Right? So those are some basic concepts in the optimization theorem. Uh, we're not uh, asking everybody to be an expert in this optimization, optimization theory, but we just want to introduce those uh, uh, basic concepts for us to understand how do we convert the primal form SM to the dual form. Then by solving the dual form, we can get some, we can, we can look at some structure uh, of the uh, SVM um, solution. And with that structure, you can see how can we uh, extend SVM from linear classifiers to nonlinear classifiers, okay? Because in general, uh, suppose we have this uh, constraint optimization problem where we want to minimize uh, an objective function f of x subject to a set of M constraints, right? Each constraint is specified by an inequality that g1x less than or equal to zero, g2x less than or equal to zero until gm of x less than or equal to zero, right? So f g1, g2 to gm can be convex function, can be non-convex function, doesn't matter. And uh, uh, we call f of x as the objective function and those uh, g1x, g2x to gm of x are uh, uh, as constraint function, right? So uh, we explained in the last lecture that such a general constraint optimization problem uh, is actually equivalent to another optimization problem, right? uh, which is a uh, minimax optimization problem. Right? So first of all, uh, the objective for this minimax uh, problem is a so-called Lagrange function, right? uh, which adds up the original objective function f of x and a weighted summation of the constraint function, right? The weight for each constraint function lambda i here is called a Lagrange multiplier, right? Which is uh, I, that everyone uh, in your calculus one have heard of this uh, term before, right? And then we'll construct a new function, right? You can view it as augmented function. I right? augmented the original objective f of x with a weighted summation of the uh, um, uh, constraint functions, right? 
then this Lagrange function is a function of uh, two inputs. One is the input x. Uh, the other is the uh, Lagrange multipliers, right? So in this minimax optimization problem, um, in the inner level, we're gonna maximize the Lagrange function with respect to lambda, but we put a non-negative constraint over lambda. So basically we want uh, every Lagrange multiplier to be non-negative, right? And in the outer level, we minimize the Lagrange function with respect to X. But here, X doesn't have any constraint. So uh, we can use a very uh, simple logic to show why these are, the two problems are, are, are equivalent, uh, which I'm not gonna repeat again, right? Uh, but the benefit here is that by uh, reforming this constraint optimization problem as a minimax optimization problem, you actually remove the possible complex constraints over X. So X is free now. We only need to introduce non-negative Lagrange multipliers, right? Those non-negative constraints are usually much easier um, to handle than considering a set of uh, uh, constraint functions like G1, G2, G3, right? Those are, those functions can be highly nonlinear right? and quite complicated. So we call, this minimax problem as the primal problem. Why, why this primal problem? Because uh, it is uh, directly uh, e equal to the uh, original constraint optimization problem. Right? But if we switch the order of minimax, right? We use the same Lagrange function, right? Now in the inner level, we minimize Lagrange function uh, with respect to X. In the outer level, then in the outer level, we maximize the Lagrange function with respect to non-negative Lagrange multipliers, right? This optimization problem is called dual form, right? So the only difference between primal and the dual forms is the order of the mean and max, right? So primal is doing minimax and dual form is doing max mean. That's it, right? Um, but the subtleties here are that the solution of these two uh, problems uh, usually are different. In general, if you can solve the dual form and you can solve the primal form and you look at at optimum, what is the uh, value of the Lagrange function, you see that the dual will be less than or equal to primal. Right? Uh, so this is some general uh, result. And proof is, uh, uh, as I mentioned in the last lecture, uh, is actually uh, not hard. It's, uh, it's just, it's pretty simple. Uh, just a few uh, inequalities and connect uh, together, you can show this. Right? Uh, but that's not the uh, uh, focus of our class. Uh, if you're interested, you can take a look at this proof. If you're not interested, you can just uh, skip it. But here, because we are looking at SVM, right? And the nice property uh, of SVM is that in the SVM objective function or an SVM optimization problem, the dual form is totally equivalent to the primal form, meaning that we can switch max mean, we solve that SVM Lagrange function from SVM objective, right? And then at optimum, uh, the Lagrange function of the dual optimum is exactly the same as the Lagrange of the primal optimum. Right? Um, the major reason is simply because uh, the, the constraints and also the constraint functions and also the objective function of SVM is convex. And uh, more rigorously speaking, they're super convex, uh, and then their feasible region contains at least one interior point. So uh, there's some like a famous theory in the convex optimization uh, gives you such a, uh, conclusion, but we don't need to uh, worry about that. Uh, we just need to know this is just uh, some known conclusion. Okay. <clears throat> so now with these uh, basic concepts I, and ideas like primal and dual form uh, ready, right? let us try to apply them to our SVM objective function. Right? So we're gonna go back to the soft SVM objective function, right? if we can uh, try to recall, right? <laughs> So 
in addition to the weight vector and bias parameter, remember here we, I'm uh, oh, sorry, uh, here we uh, we have the weight vector and the bias parameter, right? For every example, I will introduce a slack variable, right? see CI. So we require that for each example, I, the corresponding slack variable, because CI is non active. And in addition, we require that the functional margin, right? Which is this uh, product label times uh, the classification score, which is called functional margin. Right? The functional margin will be no less than one minus CI. So what's the meaning of this, uh, this constraints? Could anyone recall? Yes, exactly, right? So CI is some kind of like soft variables, right? If CI is a uh, uh, zero, that means your function margin will be uh, no less than one, right? That means your xi, yi, your, your, your example just to stay on or outside margin, right? But if CI can be strictly bigger than zero, then the function margin can, margin can be less than one, right? That means uh, you allow xi to break into the margin, right? As to whether if every xi, I mean the training example i, should break into the margin or stay on the margin, outside margin, uh, it, it, will, it will be determined by solving this whole optimization problem, right? Just to refresh our mind, right? Uh, what's the motivation of soft SVM, right? And then in the objective function, uh, we have this uh, half W transpose W, which uh, maximizes margin. And also we have this summation of all slack variables. Right? So what's the usage of this summation of slack variables? Yes, yes. Right. Do you want to supplement or are you too? Uh, the first term is trying to maximize the margin. Right? I mean, what's the, what's the, uh, why it is important to include this uh, second term, summation of the uh, slack variables? Yes. The reason is that we want as small uh, number of examples as possible to break into the margin, right? We still want to correctly classify most of the training examples. Otherwise, your training error will be large. Right? And remember, we want to maximize, we want to minimize the generalization error bound. Right? The bound is determined not only by some VC dimension, and also by the train error, right? And you can like, if you don't consider this term, right? That means you can freely allow as many examples uh, to be excluded. In other words, breaking to the margin as possible, right? Then the price is that your train error could possibly increase very fast. Okay. Although you got a, a big margin, okay. you got a big margin, you got a smaller visa dimension, but in overall, the training error plus that bound, that the, 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 the addition term determined by visa dimension could uh, overall be large. Okay. So that's that's why we should introduce a summation over select variables to control or to allow some kind of trade off. And we don't want to uh, exclude too many data points. Okay. And so that we can maintain a good training error. Okay, so <clears throat> now this is a typical constraint optimization problem, right? So let us uh, apply the primal form, right? Let us look at the primal form, right? So uh, we just contrast to the standard form, right? This will be our f of x objective function, right? And those guys are our constraint function, right? And remember that if we want to uh, convert it to the primal form, the standard form requires that, okay, your constraint functions will be something like that, right? Less than or equal to zero. That means you need to, uh, you need to uh, uh, reorganize the form such that it can match this, right? So you can take the square, you can take the minor sign uh, on both sides, right? On this guy and this guy, now you can change the direction of the inequality, right? And also you take minus sign here, and you change the direction of the inequality so that you got GIX will be the left-hand side of this uh, uh, inequalities, right? Now for the constraint regarding functional margin, uh, for each example, we introduce uh, 
a Lagrange multiplier denoted by alpha i, right? And for non-active constraint of the CIs, we introduce a Lagrange multiplier denoted by beta i, right? And then we just apply, we just construct the Lagrange function, which is the original function, plus, you know, this part is the weighted summation of the constraint function, right? Right. But here, for each example i, we got two constraints, right? One is uh, about function margin, the other is about the uh, select variable, right? For function margin, this, the uh, uh, Lagrange multiplier is denoted, denoted by alpha i, and for the select variable, uh, the uh, Lagrange multiplier is denoted by beta i. Um, you just uh, substitute them for lambda i and gix, you get our Lagrange function, right? It's just the this is just some instanti instantiation of uh, the uh, general uh, primal form, right. and then uh, we know that the uh, original parameters which we want to optimize include W and B and uh, the uh, select variables PCIs, right? And then we introduce the Lagrange multipliers, which are alpha i's and beta i's, and we we require them to be non-active. And then we do a minimax over this Lagrange function. This is our primal form of the soft SVM objective. Does it make sense? I mean, this is just a, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you don't say, uh, so every detail uh, in one minute, it doesn't matter. I, if, if, if you just, uh, after class, you just, you just look back at our previous slides and contrast it to the standard form of the primal uh, you you get it. It's just a simple uh, algebraic um, substitution. Um, substitute, okay. So now we got the primal form, right? We got this minimax optimization of the Lagrange function over SVM uh, objective function, right? And in the uh, inner level, we maximize the Lagrange multipliers. Of course, we want the Lagrange multipliers to be non-active. And in the other level, we minimize our model parameters, WB and KCIs uh, without constraints, right? So now let us look at the dual form. As we mentioned, right, dual form is just to switch the order of maximum. Right? The objective function here is still the Lagrange function, doesn't change. Uh, but in the inner level, we're gonna minimize WB and the KCIs. And in the outer level, we maximize the Lagrange multipliers. Right? So um, here's some justification. Uh, According to the Slater's condition for convex optimization, we can show that uh, solving this dual uh, optimization problem is equivalent to solving this primal optimization problem. Right? That means that um, you can solve the dual form of the SVM uh, as your training uh, procedure. Right? Next, we're gonna look at how to solve the dual form. Uh, as we mentioned, right, the dual form actually is very, very important because if you analyze the solution, of the dual form, you'll find some interesting structure and it also paved the way to extend your um, SVM to nonlinear SVM. Okay, now let us look at the dual form SVM. It's a maximum problem, right? So uh, this is by level optimization problem uh, looks kind of awkward, right? We don't want to uh, direct, directly consider how we do max step and mean step like alternatively, right? So I actually want to simplify uh, this um, uh, dual form a little bit. Right? How, how do we do that? Right? Let us look at the inner minimization first. Right? So suppose in the outside, uh, those Lagrange multipliers are given. Right? So I want to first solve the inner minimization problem. Right? How do how to do solve that? We just take gradient, right? Because when we have this uh, objective function, like right, it is when we view this function as a function of WB and CI, if we want to get minimum, we know that this function is continuous, right? So it's differentiable. That means the, the minimum is achieved when you have a gradient to be zero. So we can simply take the gradient of the well, Lagrange function with respect to W plus B and also each um, slack variable CI to be zero, right? And let's see, when we solve these three 
types of in uh, three types of equalities what can we get right? so uh, for the first one if you view l as a function of w you see this actual quadratic function right? you take a gradient um, these terms and uh, all these terms contain containing w right if you take a gradient it set the gradient to be zero um, it's pretty straightforward to find that w is equal to this summation over every training example where each summon is alpha i, y i, and x i. Okay? So y i is a label, right? Y i is a label for the i example is either positive one or minus two, minus, uh, minus one, right? And x i is just the input vector, the i input vector, right? And alpha i is the Lagrange multiplier, right? For the uh, function margin constraint, right? And then, if you take the gradient with uh, bias parameter b, right, what can we get? There's only one term um, regarding the bias parameter b. And also, it doesn't contain like quadratic term about b, right? It's just a linear term. So solve this gradient to be zero. Uh, actually, have a b cancel that out. You only have this uh, summation over every example where each sum is alpha i, y i. This sum is zero. Okay. And similarly, for every slack variable CI, if you take the gradient of L with respect to CI to be zero, you can see that this is CI and this contains CI, right? You take the gradient of CI to be zero, you will obtain a third result that for every training example I, the Lagrange multiplier of I plus Lagrange multiplier beta I equals to C, right? C is the constant here, right? It's the trade off between, you know, the rockerizer and the hinge of, right? So, so those are three, four, right? Everyone's comfortable, right? It's, I, I'm just illustrating like how, uh, how, how you take the gradient for this uh, uh, relatively simple form and set the gradient to be zero, right? And then once we get those results, let us try to uh, substitute the res results back into L, right? So that you can directly get a result of the inner minimization result, right? You only leave uh, one more level like maximization problem, right? So if you substitute them back to L, um, here we get, right? So I'm not gonna show how to do that because it's a, it's a little bit tedious, um, but just to substitute the representation of W, substitute uh, this guy and this guy uh, into this objective function, you'll find that now after solving the inner minimization problem, you only have uh, one maximization problem outside. And now the objective function becomes a function of uh, alpha i's only. And PCI i's are removed, beta are removed, and only leaving the Lagrange multipliers alpha i's. And of course, if you want to get these results, you need to ensure that these two uh, gradient must be zero, right? So you need to add back these uh, two uh, constraints. That is for every example i, uh, you sum up alpha i, y i, the summation must be zero. And also for every example i, alpha i plus beta i equals to c. Those two results coming from when we solve an inner minimization problem, right? And if you want to have this form, you must have these uh, two um, uh, results uh, satisfied. Right? So now, <clears throat> We have uh, simplified our dual form of SVM into a constrained maximization problem, right? This is just by, you know, directly manually solving an inner minimization problem. Does it make sense? Right? So we can uh, do some kind of further uh, simplification. Right? Um, so we can see that uh, actually, because the objective function only contains alpha i's, right? It never contains beta i's. And it also will only require like, okay, beta i must be non-active and alpha i plus beta i equals to c, right? So that means actually we, we never need to explicitly um, solve beta i, right? We know that for our, every alpha i, uh, this beta i must be c minus uh, alpha i, right? And also we want this, beta i to be non-active, that means alpha i must be uh, less than or equal to c. 
Does it make sense? All right, so, so, so we can further simplify this by uh, removing beta i's, right? So now we can see that we have uh, arrived at a even simpler form, right? So first, maximization problem is equivalent to minimize the negative objective function. So we just uh, put a minus sign in front of this, right? So we get minimization. And second, we get rid of beta i. That means we just need to add an additional constraint that alpha i must be less than or equal to c, right? And also, we need to respect that um, uh, the constraint that the summation of alpha i, y i uh, must be zero, right? So now we have arrived a much simpler and easier form of the SVM, which is called dual form. Does it make sense? It, 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 you're not required like to follow every uh, detailed algebraic operation over this and to derive this. I just uh, want to deliver you the path to get with, uh, to get here. But it's not it's not hard at all. But just need a few steps. And but I do uh, recommend you guys after the class to you know. Follow this and try to try to arrive here. Okay, so <clears throat> now let us look at this uh, problem. Right? Um, from the optimization perspective, this is a called a quadratic convex optimization problem. Right? Why this quadratic? Because uh, it essentially optimizes alpha. Right? So here, alpha is a vector. If you will, uh, alpha one. Alpha two, remember, for every training example, you got some alpha, right? So suppose you have a alpha n, right? You have alpha n, you have n training examples. So if you will, if we put all those alpha values into one vector, right, it would be denoted by alpha two there, right? So this guy can also be written as kind of like a quadratic function in terms of alpha two there. Okay. Um, if you're interested to, well, this, is, this can be important in your, uh, homework uh, four, uh, because someone, it, it, we ask you to solve this, right? uh, just to call some like off the shelf optimization package to solve that. Some students come, one uh, past the student complain that, okay, why I directly uh, solving this is really slow. The reason is that you're just uh, doing some double double for loop here, right? Um, but if you can represent this guy as uh, some vector form, vector matrix form, uh, life will become a lot easier your optimization will be instantly fast. Okay. So, um, yeah, I can give you the hint, right? Um, but I'm, I'm not gonna, gonna explain how do you, uh, how do you, um, how the final form comes from, but basically you can view it as uh, X, um, X transpose and uh, admiral wise product with YY transpose and then alpha tilde transpose alpha tilde. Okay. Uh, this will be equivalent to this uh, double summation. Okay. And, and hopefully this will be of some benefit to students really pay attention to the lecture. <laughs> if you do do that, uh, you, can, you can work on this uh, uh, by yourself, okay? And this guy means atomwise product because this is a matrix, this is a matrix, right? You this, uh, uh, this circle just means you just multiply the element, elements of the two matrices one by one. Okay. So now, <clears throat> given this uh, uh, quadratic convex optimization problem, of course, it has some like a constraints, uh, which is called box constraints and also linear constraints, right? Um, there are some kind of standard convex op optimization library uh, you can use to solve them. And we'll recommend you some uh, uh, some SciPy optimization package to solve that. You don't need to worry about how to address that, uh, address this con con uh, uh, constraint optimization problem. Uh, we re uh, we encourage you to use off-the-shelf algorithms to solve that. Like, so now we have uh, uh, finished the introduction of the dual form. Right? But then the question is that why would we like to solve the dual form of SVM? Uh, why don't we just remove all kinds of constraints, right? And uh, remove the CIs and uh, going back to the previous lectures, like we have some uh, regularization term plus some uh, hinge loss, right? We can use the cut sub gradient to solve that. Why would we bother to uh, using a bunch of a series of the derivations to arrive here, but still ends up uh, solving some constraint optimization problem? We're gonna discuss about the next step. We'll see that uh, this form, will enable 
the kernel trick and nonlinear classification, even in the infinite dimensional space. And also, it will save the model storage through the so called super, super vectors. Right? Later, we'll explain what we mean by super vectors. Right? So, now let us put those uh, questions in our mind. Right? Let us assume okay, we have found some powerful off the shelf optimization package. Right? We solve this dual form so that we have uh, obtained the optimal Lagrange multipliers alpha one star to alpha big n star. So, big n here indicates the number of training examples. Right? Remember every example, you have a, a alpha i, you have beta i. Alpha i is a constraint for the Lagrange, uh, for the for the for the uh, 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 function margin, and the beta i is for the constraint for non-negative uh, select variables, right? So <clears throat> a natural question will be: Okay, if we have already uh, found the optimal alpha i's. How do we use those optimal alpha i's to recover the optimal weight vector and the bus parameter? This is, of course, uh, is important because W and B are the real model parameters we want to uh, uh, want to seek for. Right? The recovery of the W is pretty straightforward because when we solve the inner minimization problem, right? Uh, we take the gradient of the Lagrange function with respect to W, and we set this gradient to be zero, we can directly obtain the results that W essentially is a weighted summation of the training inputs, right? For each training input Xi, it will be weighted by alpha I and Yi. Remember Yi is either one or minus one. So when you have this optimal Alpha, alpha i star, right? Alpha i, is, which is denoted by alpha i star, right? So your optimal weight vector is just obtained by replacing those alpha i's by their optimal values, right? So you immediately get the, uh, or recovered the optimal weight vector, right? By doing a weighted summation over the training inputs, right? Does it make sense? Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, the optimal. Yeah. And another question? Okay, then the question is, how do we get to the bus prime to B? And this is a little bit uh, non-trivial. Um, unfortunately, you cannot directly derive them from uh, all the previous uh, step we have gone through. Okay. So to uh, get B, uh, we need to use some optimization uh, theory results. Right? So um, we're gonna introduce the so-called uh, KKD conditions. Okay. So KKD conditions kind of like a central testing conditions in optimization theory, which shows up in every optimization block. Right? Again, we're not gonna talk about how these are derived and why, uh, and uh, we, we only introduced the uh, definition. And based on this definition, what kind of conclusion can we get? Like, we're not gonna talk, talk about the proof. Right? So what are KKD conditions? So again, real KKD conditions are as the set of testing conditions, right? For a particular um, of constraint optimization problem. Right? And we will do some optimization procedure, right? We search over, this, uh, search over the possible solution, right? If you'll find candidate satisfy the KED conditions, you can give some uh, uh, conclusion or claim. So basically the KED conditions are just some test conditions to give you some result. So let us look at what are KKD conditions. So first, the KKD conditions are associated with uh, a particular constraint optimization problem. And here, for simplicity, we only look at a convex program, meaning that the objective function f0x here is convex, and every constraint function f1 to f big M is, con is convex as well. Right? But there is general, uh, K, uh, general definition of KKD conditions for any uh, constraint optimization problem. Right? Let us just look at this uh, uh, convex program, right? So for a particular pair of input X and lambda, right? You can wheel like X and lambda. X are the input to the objective function, right? Lambda are corresponding to the Lagrange multipliers, right? 
if x and lambda satisfy these four groups of um, conditions, then we call that x and lambda satisfy the KKT conditions. Right? So what are these four groups of conditions? First, we require that the x satisfy every constraints, meaning that f m x less than or equal to zero for every m from one to big M, right? That means, okay, your x just to satisfy the uh, constraint in the um, target problem, right? And secondly, we want lambda to be non-active, right? Mean that, okay, this Lagrange multipliers must be non-active, right? And third one is very interesting. Third one tells that for every constraint function, right? The product between the corresponding element in lambda, that is lambda m, and the constraint function is zero. So lambda one, f one of x is zero, lambda two, f two of x is zero, until lambda big M, f big M of x is zero. So this type of uh, KD conditions is called complementary slackness. What is called complementary slack slackness? You can we can view like okay, uh, if it turns out lambda m is strictly bigger than zero, then to satisfy this complementary slackness, that means uh, the constraint function must be zero, right? And vice versa, right? If f f, f of m mx is uh, strictly less than zero, then lambda m must be zero. This is very, very important. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, in a minute. Right? Okay, then the last uh, uh, condition in the KKD conditions uh, is the gradient of the Lagrange function at x is zero. That's it. So this is a Lagrange function, right? You take the gradient with respect to x um, and uh, you want this gradient to be zero. Does it make sense? Those are just definitions. So if for a particular pair of X and Lambda, right, they satisfy this uh, four groups of conditions, right? Namely KKD conditions, what kind of conclusion can we draw? So first, KKD conditions can be viewed as some sufficient condition uh, for you to judge that if you have already found a solution, right? Um, specifically, right? For particular X star and Lambda star, if they satisfy the KKD conditions as we just discussed, right? Then we can, we can claim that this X star is the solution of the constraint convex optimization problem. Right? So basically this is a test condition, right? You use whatever methods, right? you, you can even do random guess, you find some X star and, and Lambda star. And if you can, uh, if, if you test X star and Lambda star, they satisfy all these four groups of conditions, then you can claim that, okay, I have already found a solution for this uh, convex program. That's what this uh, uh, Lambda means. Does it make sense? Right. Unfortunately, KKD conditions in general cannot be viewed as necessary conditions uh, for the optimum, meaning that you might have some uh, solution to this convex program, right? To this convex program, uh, which do not satisfy the KKD conditions. So you can see the difference, right? Sufficient and necessary conditions. Sufficient conditions mean that, okay, if you satisfy this sufficient conditions, okay, I can say, okay, you find a solution. Right? Necessary condition means that, okay, if this is your solution, then you must satisfy back that conditions, right? But, but KD conditions are not necessary, meaning that not every solution of this convex program will satisfy the KD conditions. Right? Hopefully um, you won't get confused here, right? But here, uh, we want to emphasize a special case. If your constraints are sufficiently simple, that is your constraints 
can be written as some kind of like linear inequalities. Here they, they, they call it alpha inequalities. To me, there's nothing different. Like, then KKD conditions are also necessary conditions. So that means, okay, if your convex program, well, F0x is convex, right? And then your constraint can be written as kind of linear form. Like this is a vector, right? This is a vector, and this is a vector, right? This actually tells you that, okay, uh, the first, if you can will A as some row vector, right? A1, A2 to A, M, right? This is A, okay? This just tells you that, okay, A1 X less than or equal to B1, right? And A2 X less than or equal to B2 and continue, right? So you can see that actually each particular constraint is just a linear function. If your convex program satisfy this form, right? Then KKT conditions, are both sufficient and necessary for your solution. Meaning that for any X star, lambda star, if they satisfy key con conditions, okay, they guarantee to be the solution of this problem. Right? And on the other hand, for any solution of this problem, then you must uh, be able to find a lambda star such that X star and lambda star obey the KKD conditions. Why should why 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 do we uh, emphasize this particular case? Could anyone imagine why? Yeah, yeah. For what? Remember, we're centering around SVM, right? Those are just the general theorems, right? We want to say, okay, if those theories can apply to SVM. So now if you look at look back at SVM, like look at these constraints. They're all linear functions, right? If you just uh, reorganize them, rearrange them, you will see they all obey the form like that. Right? So that means uh, SVM is formulation is so smart, right? It's just uh, happened to um, in this special case where the KKT conditions are both sufficient and necessary. So that means whenever I find a solution in my dual form, right? and then it must, this solution must satisfy all these uh, four KKT conditions, right? And this KKT conditions actually tells you, okay, what's the relationship between those optimal parameters. Right? Based on those relationship, we try to recover the bus, optimal bus parameter B. Right? That's the logic. Does it make sense? For the, yes. Yes. Yeah, because, because as we just mentioned, right, we, we can, uh, based on optimal alpha, right, it is fairly straightforward to get optimal W, right? But there's no way to directly get a B. So how can we how can we get B, right? We need to introduce some additional relationships between W and B and, and to say, you know, alpha i's to recover B. Right? And those relationships are reflecting KKD conditions. Does it make sense? Right. Okay. Because KKD conditions are both sufficient necessary, right? So that means, okay, as long as I can solve this uh, uh, dual form, uh, sorry, this is primal form. Right? If we can solve the dual form, we can just uh, apply the KKD conditions, right? So that will add additional relationship between W and B, because they are those, those kind of guy, and combining with the previous relationship we got, then we can expect we recover the B. Right? So, <clears throat> What kind of KKD conditions uh, do we want to use right, to help us recover B, right? We're gonna use uh, the complementary slackness. Right? 
as we emphasized a minute ago, right? So this, this is uh, the complementary slackness. That is the product of every Lagrange multiplier and its corresponding constraint function is zero, right? When you arrive at the optimum, right? So here for the SVM, we got two types of uh, constraints for every training example. One is uh, about the functional margin, right? The other is about the slack variable, right? For this guy, we introduce the alpha i uh, as the Lagrange multiplier, right? For this guy, we introduce beta, right? So now uh, at the optimum, because they satisfy the KKD conditions, that means uh, for every example i, we have this product to be zero, right? So beta i, the optimal beta i times the optimal KCI, i, which are denoted by star, right? Is zero, and also r phi star times this uh, constraint function regarding the function margin must be zero. Right? And then we're gonna combine with the result when we derive the inner minimization. Right? When we do the inner minimization, we will take the gradient of the Lagrange function with respect to CI, we know that alpha i plus beta i equals to c, right? So now we have uh, three groups of uh, uh, results at the optimal, right? Uh, the first two comes from the uh, KKD conditions, more specifically complementary slackness, right? And third one comes from when we solve the due, the gradient will be zero, we know that for every i, alpha i plus beta i must be c, right? Now let's see whether we can use these three groups of conditions or three groups of results to derive the optimum D. Right? So I just list them here, right? How do we get B, right? <clears throat> optimum B, right? So we know that for every example I or I example J, we got some like optimal R5, right? So let's look at from the training examples, right? Let's find some particular example J such that R for J star is right between zero and C. Strictly bigger than zero, strictly bigger, strictly less than C, not equal to zero, not equal to C. Let's see what will happen if we can leverage this R for G star. Right? So first, we know that the beta G star according to this, right, is C minus alpha G star, right? And alpha G star is strictly less than C. That means beta G star will be strictly bigger than zero. Does this make sense? Right? This is according to here, right? We find some alpha G star, which is strictly less than C. Right. Then we know that beta G star must be C minus that, C minus alpha G star, and beta G star must be bigger than zero. Right. Now look at the complementary slackness about beta G star and C G star. Right. We know that beta G star must be zero, then C G star must be zero, right? because their product must be zero. Right. This is the first uh, observation we can get. Right. And the second observation is that because alpha G star is strictly bigger than zero, right? If you look at this complementary slackness, this guy is bigger than zero, then this guy must be zero. Right? That is the constraint function regarding the functional margin must be zero. Right? That's where we get. Right? And even better, because we know that from our first observation, the optimal Cassie G star is zero as well. Okay? This is our first observation. And then we know that the function margin is right one, right? It's just one. And then we have already got our optimal weight vector W star, right? And the B just the YG subtracted by the dot product between the V vector and XG. Does this reasoning make sense? Any question? I can go over this again with you. We feel it's, uh, it's kind of uh, challenging. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. Yeah, let me emphasize the prerequisite. Is that okay? We solve our SMQ with some you know powerful constraint optimization problem so that we got the optimal alpha J's, right? All the alpha, alpha one, alpha two, alpha star, um, alpha three on the alpha uh, on, on the alpha big end, right? So now I want to use this optimal alpha values to recover W and B, right? And optimal W is very easy to recover because we know it's just the weighted summation right? over the training inputs. The headache is how to recover optimal B. So to address that problem, we're gonna leverage uh, the KKT conditions and also some intermediate results when you do this optimization, right? So the KKT conditions, we're gonna use two groups of complementary slackness. Um, that is first, the optimal beta I times optimal KCI I for every training example I, the product is zero, right? And also the optimal alpha I times the constraint function regarding function margin is always zero. And then we just go over every example, right? We look at, we could, we'll pick up any example whose optimal alpha J is right between zero and C, right? It's bigger than zero, it's less than C, right? And then we just look at the value of corresponding beta J and C J. Right? According to the first complementary slackness, right? Because beta J star is bigger than zero. Why? Because according to the result here, right, we know that alpha I, alpha J star is less than C and then beta J star must be bigger than zero. Then according to the first complementary slackness, we know that the slack variable C J star is simply zero. Okay. And the second observation is that because alpha J star is exactly bigger than zero, right? So know that the constraint function must be zero. That's where you get here, right? And combined with the first observation, you know, because CG star is zero. So we immediately get the conclusion that the function margin is simply one. Right? And because W star is already knowing, so the optimum B star is uh, straightforward to calculate. Does it make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. We spent, yeah, we, uh, that's our, I think it's at the uh, previous slides, right? So this is the SVM objective function, right? We first convert to the primal form, right? right? For the primal form, that means for each constraint function, you introduce Lagrange multiplier, right? We mentioned that for the constraint function regarding the function margin, we introduce R phi. For the non-active slack variable, this constraint we introduce the Lagrange multiplier beta. Then we just follow the standard primal formulation, we get our primal form of SVM. And then we kind of like simplify, we just, then we look at the dual form, we uh, simplify the dual form, we arrive at uh, the, uh, oops. We arrive at the dual form, right? And in the dual form, actually the objective function only minimize uh, alpha i's because those betas, those uh, um, w and b are all just removed. And the problem is, that, okay, even I got the optimum alpha is just a part of uh, Lagrange multipliers, right? I want to recover the optimum W and B. How can we do that? Right? And if, to recover W, uh, well, it's pretty simple because uh, in our inner minimization problem, right? We solve the gradient with respect to W to be zero. We know that W is just the weighted summation of the inputs weighted by this Lagrange multipliers alpha is, right? So just substitute them. You get off from W, right? Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 I know this uh, uh, um, 
I know this is a little bit, uh, I mean, it is easy to get disconnected because uh, they're, they're kind of like a, a long reasoning chain. <laughs> and you got a bunch of uh, steps, right? but, uh, but, uh, but there's uh, nothing to worry about. Every step, every step is really uh, relatively straightforward, but you need to connect them to get the final result. Right? Again, you, do, you are not required to capture every, to keep track every step during the class. It's, that that would be uh, a bit, little bit challenging. But as long as you get to know, okay, what, what every step we're doing, then after class, uh, if you can review the slides again, I will connect everything. Oh, you mean some extreme case that I don't have an RFG right between zero and C, right? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, this case in practice is rare, um, but in case, if it has happened, you cannot find some alpha G. That means your alpha G is either zero or either C, right? Then what, how can we get B? That's your question, right? Yeah. In this case, we can now use KD conditions as well. Then we can go back to our Yeah, yeah. Can I see it again? Uh huh. Um, that's a good question, but you need to you need to reason on that. You need to you you uh you need to think about that. Right? But let me first uh, uh finish the question that in the extreme case where you don't get some alpha g star right between zero and c. Right? That means your alpha g is either zero or either c. How can you ask and b? Right? Um, in my past uh, experience, some students ask that. Some students don't ask that. But here, I want to show you that in general, if you really don't have that, that R for G star, you can first, you can look back the original formulation of SVM. Remember, it is uh, some kind of um, regularizer plus the hinge loss, right? So the hinge loss is max zero and one minus the function margin, right? Right. So actually W here is already known. So you can going back to really optimize this objective function with some SVM, some subgradient descent, you can still get B. So this is a general framework. But if you if you can find the alpha G star right between zero and C, of course you can use this method because it's relatively easy to implement. Does it make sense? Right. Um, but in, uh, in practice, uh, um, I would say this is very rare. And for robustness, if you happen to have multiple such examples whose between whose alpha g star is between zero and c, and then you can obtain multiple estimate of b star, right? And to be robust, you can just take an average over such j to get a more robust estimate of b. Does it make sense? Okay, let us continue. I'm gonna uh, answer a question uh, later because uh, I'm gonna introduce a very important concept called the uh, support vectors. Then we'll, we'll take a look at the positions of support vectors and you can see whether in which kind of cases we can view it as kind of hard as we in which kind of cases not, okay? So, <clears throat> Now we have uh, the way, we have methods to recover W and B, right? Given the dual uh, solution, right? We look at the structure of optimal weight vector, right? We know the optimal weight vector is a weighted summation over all the training inputs, right? So we sum over every training example XI weighted by 
label yi, which is either one minus one, and also the optimal Lagrange multiplier of j of i star. Right? So natural question is, what if uh, for some Lagrange multiplier of i is zero? If it is zero, that means uh, this xi doesn't contribute to the optimal V vector at all, right? So in other words, the optimal V vector is only determined by samples, training samples with non-zero of G star. Does it make sense? Because you can imagine you got like um, 1,000 examples, right? And you, for every example, you got some R for I, like R for one, R for two, R for three, right? And, and actually many, many R for I stars are, are zero. That means when you use them to compute the open weight vector, those examples are with zero R for I star have nothing to do with this V vector because they're multiplied with X I simply zero, right? So the optimal V vector is only determined by those examples, those input examples with non-zero of i. So we call these subset examples as support vectors. Right? This is where the support vectors come from. Support vectors are the training inputs which make real contribution to construct the optimal V vector. Does it make sense? Like, so that's why, that's why they call support vector machines. This comes from the observation of the solution structure. Like we found a solution structure from the dual, the optimal V vector essentially is just the weighted summation of the support vectors. Like, So now let us look at some support vector, right? Suppose xj is a support vector. That means the corresponding Lagrange multiplier alpha g star must be strictly bigger than zero, right? So according to the complementary slackness, because this guy is bigger than zero, then the constraint function regarding the function margin is zero, right? So that means the function margin is one minus cj star, right? And because we know that this slack variable is always a non-negative, right? that means for this support vector xg, its function margin is less than or equal to one, right? It actually tells us that support vectors uh, are either on the margin, because when it's one, it's on the margin, right? Or break into the margin because it could be less than one. So, Paul vectors must be on the margin or inside the margin. This is, is, this is a directly derived uh, um, from the KD conditions, right? Now, I want to ask. What if a support vector stays inside the margin? When do a support vector stays inside the margin? Uh, I start <laughs> case case. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I mean, quantitatively, okay. I mean, which 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 variables of value can be indicative that, that this example stay inside the margin? The slack variable, right? A slack variable. Actually, if we went, uh, if we look at a support vector to CJ, uh, if its value is strictly bigger than zero, right? This guy is strictly bigger than zero. That means your function margin is less than one, right? That means, okay, this example is actually inside the margin or breaking to the margin, right? 
And then let us use the KKT conditions again, right? Because CJ star is uh, bigger than zero, according to the complementary slackness, okay, we know that the product of beta J star and uh, Cosy G star is zero, okay? And this guy is bigger than zero, and this guy, that must be zero, okay? This is from, uh, from here, okay? So if beta, uh, beta G star is zero, that means uh, alpha G star must be C, right? Because their summation must be C, right? So this tells us that, okay, if a support vector stays inside the margin, then the corresponding R for J star will be its maximum, which is C. So now going back to your question, we know R for J star is zero, it just means, okay, this example is not, um, is not a support, support vector, right? And if R of G star is equal to C, this just means uh, the support vector, it is support vector and the support vector stay inside the margin, right? So that means uh, even all your R of Gs are either zero and C, you still have examples uh, break into the margin you still can now say, okay, it's a hard scan. So this is very interesting uh, derivation, like if you can use those uh, KKD conditions and to look at the relationship between the solutions, you can find many, many interesting results. Okay, now we want to give a, a more intuitive uh, uh, view of possible back machines, right? So <clears throat> suppose this is our, uh, learn classifier, right? This is a classification boundary, and this actually indicates the margin, right? And those are positive examples or negative examples, right? From what we have uh, seen so far, the optimal bit vector actually is only determined by the support vectors. And the support vectors are either on the margin or inside the margin. In other words, for those examples which are far away from a margin, which means that they are well separated by our classifier, they actually do not contribute to the construction of op optimal bit vector at all. Okay. We mentioned before, right? So um, those examples which break into the margin seems to be some outliers, some annoying outliers. Okay? And we want to separate out the majority of examples with as much larger as possible, right? But unfortunately, uh, to determine where, which position this optimal wave vector um, is mainly determined by those outliers. And also some points stay right, right on the margin. Does it make sense? And this also reveals the result that the solution of uh, support back machines, I mean, the dual form is actually quite sparse because for all the examples uh, outside the margin, the corresponding R of I must be zero. Okay. So that means many, many uh, examples, the corresponding R of I is simply zero. And the W star is only determined by a much smaller subset of uh, support vectors. Okay. So yeah. You, and in addition, that means uh, if we can just store the support vectors right, rather than the final weight, uh, it is also okay. We can also um, recover the optimal weight. Okay, any questions so far?
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you you feel like a little bit uncomfortable with that, right? Uh, okay, you can uh, you can think about in, uh, in another way. Like so, uh, to train and support back machines, essentially you're determining um, which all liars you're gonna exclude, and then by excluding those all liars, you want to separate out the remaining examples to be as much as possible, right? Of course, the all liars actually is very important for you to decide where you're gonna place your uh, classification boundary, right? Because you need to decide which, which you, you, need, you need to pick up which all liars you, you, you're gonna exclude, right? And this, this, uh, this influence is kind of mutual, right? You pick them, you exclude them, and also when you pick them, you exclude them, it kind of partly determine where your distance boundary should be. Yes, yes. Actually, because those outliers must be break, uh, must be inside the margin, right? That, uh, that, uh, that actually tells you that, okay, you should place here, right? You should put here, and they are close enough to you. And so that you can, you can, you can just uh, enlarge your margin to separate out the remaining examples. That's the intuition. But it's, uh, but it's, uh, it's very interesting and it's very uh, insightful results that turned out Actually, those outliers and some a few more points on the margin totally determine the decision boundary. Okay, so uh, in the last few minutes, I just want to make a start about kernels and kernel trick. Right? So uh, we'll base our palm uh, the dual form results and dual form structure to embed kernel tricks so that we can uh, extend our linear classifiers to non-linear classifiers. How can we do that, right? So uh, we know that once we get optimal W and B, right, W star and B star, we can make a prediction for any test input X, right? How can we do that? We just uh, compute a classification score, right? Dot product between the test input vector and the optimal weight vector plus bias parameter. And then we look at the sign, right? That's how we uh, make the classification results, right? <clears throat> Now that from the uh, dual form of the SVM, right? we know that the optimal weight vector essentially is the uh, weighted summation over the support vectors. Right? So <clears throat> if we just substitute this weighted summation for W star, and then calculate dot product between W star and X, right? this is where we get. Right? Right? You actually, do a summation over all the support vectors. And each summon, you're gonna compute the dot, per, dot product between the support vector and the test input, right? Then you just weight this uh, dot product by, you know, alpha i star and the label y, y. Then you do a summation over all the support vectors, you got you get this in the product result, right? You plus the bias parameter, you get a prediction score, right? So that means from the dual form solution structure, we only need to compute the dot products between the training examples that are support vectors and a new example X, right? And this applies even we pre-perform some feature mapping. Remember uh, a straightforward idea, or smart idea to extend linear classifier to be nonlinear classifier is that, okay, I'm gonna first perform some nonlinear feature mapping over the original input vector, right? So I can map them into a higher dimensional space. We believe that in a higher dimensional space, those data are mostly linearly separable. So all we need is that, okay, in a mapped feature space, which is higher, right? We find the corresponding bit vector and the bus point, right? So that means, you can first perform some feature mapping, right? Uh, in a mapped feature vector, you solve the dual form, right? And then you can represent the optimal bit vector in a mapped feature space as a weighted summation of the mapped support vectors, right? 
And then we will compute the prediction score for a new test input. Okay, you first do the feature mapping, and then you substitute this with the summation uh, for W star to compute the star product. It is still a summation of the dot product between every support vector and test input, right? The only difference is that, okay, I'm gonna first perform some feature mapping first and then do the dot product. Does it make sense? Like, So next, we're gonna take a closer look at this competition. Like we assume that, okay, we're gonna use this uh, strategy to compute our prediction score and, and make the, and decide the classification result, right? So that means we're gonna first perform some kind of uh, feature mapping to map the original input vector into some higher dimensional feature space. And then we do the dot product. We can define this as a function of x and z, right? So, um, which is first perform some feature mapping phi over x and over z respectively, and then do the dot product. Right? And then the prediction with mapped uh, feature vectors, right? Essentially is to do a, a summation over the dot product between you know, every support vector and test vector. And this is essentially first performing the uh, feature mapping and dot product, right? We, which we just replaced it by our function k, xi, and x, right? plus b, right? So someone asked, okay, what's the usage of this? Right? We just replaced, we just define function, right? Define function k of x and z, which is first perform some nonlinear feature mapping in some higher dimensional space and do a dot product. And then I just apply the dual form structure. We can get that, okay, our uh, prediction is just this guy. Right? Uh, if the computation of, the, of this k function, right, exactly follow its definition, then doing this kind of like change is just a notation of sugar. There's not any uh, practical value on that, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you want to represent the dot product after feature mapping as a key function, or you just write, write, write it out explicitly. However, if we can compute the value of K without following the definition, right? instead, even without directly computing the feature map, then we'll have some computational advantage, right? right? So the previous example may not, may not give you some, some, some good impression why this is good or why this is important, right? So you can imagine that your, 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 your feature mapping phi kind of map your x from two dimensional to like one million dimensional, very, very high. And it will explain that for some example, the feature mapping is infinite dimensional. Right? So, Assume phi is infinite, is not infinite, it's one million dimensional. So if you ca calculate this k directly following the definition, that means, okay, you first compute one million vector, right? One million dimensional vector, another one million dimensional vector, and then do the dot product over one million elements. Right? That is extremely pensive. Right? If we can have another way to compute this guy, right? without explicitly performing this feature mapping, right? for example, I just compute X and Z, the original space, like two dimensional space, then the computation is much, much cheaper. Right? And we call this type of uh, computational trick as a kernel trick, uh, which we're gonna uh, discuss in detail in the last, like, in the next lecture. Okay, see you on next Tuesday. Homework four. Uh, I think will be next Tuesday. Yeah, will be will be released on next Tuesday.